So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Nicole Schwab, and uh, who's working with uh, Sonia. And I'm so happy that you're here, Nicole, to facilitate this panel on uh, harmony with nature. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very happy to be here for this panel. Um, we've been exploring harmony in many different ways from different angles, harmony within ourselves, harmony with each other, harmony in communities. And now we want to look at this theme of harmony in relationship to nature, in relationship to the earth. And that's why, I mean, the chrysalis is kind of an apt metaphor and transition of how we, not just in our inner transformation, but what that means as a collective, in the way we go into relationship, we come into relationship with all other forms of life on this planet, with nature. And this is a topic that lies very close to my heart. I'm someone who grew up um, outside mostly, playing from a very young age outside in the fields, in the rivers, in the mountains, and feeling a very close kinship to animals and plants. And I always thought that this was shared by everybody. And as I grew up, I realized that my perspectives were, um, were not shared necessarily and that my way of seeing the world was not always understood. And today when I see where we are, um, what's happening, if I allow myself to open up to the experience of, of all of life, sometimes I'm really overcome with grief. Um, if I let that kinship sink in and really let myself feel what is happening. So this is really a topic I'm passionate about, not just within, but I would say without, and dedicating most of my time to. And I feel that we're, we're really at a time where there's a disconnect. I heard a couple of years ago, I was at a conference, I was listening to uh, the head of the Stockholm Resilience Institute, and he said, in the last 40 years, so this is my lifetime, in the last 40 years, we have changed the planet in a way that humans have not experienced yet. And in the next 40 years, we will determine the pathway that we are taking as human civilization for the next 20, 30,000 years. And this really struck me because I thought, okay, I'm in my 40s, this is my life. This is exactly my life. And I felt this enormous sense of responsibility and a sense of purpose of why am I here now and why is this happening now. And I think that, um, you know, when we, when we start to look at these issues, I just want to, I do want to lay, remi remind us of a few facts and I know that we're, we want to come down to the heart, but I think it's important for us to really understand that today we only have 45% of the planets where the ecosystems are in a natural or semi-natural state. So more than half of the ecosystems have already been destroyed or degraded. We have lost 50% of all vertebrate species in the last 40 years. We've lost 90% of large fish. Insect populations are collapsing. Um, we're seeing extinction rates a thousand times their natural, their natural baseline rate. So what's so puzzling is that we all breathe, we all eat, we all drink water. We, we need nature. Nature is our life support system, she's everything for us. And yet, we know these facts, but somehow there's this disconnect. It doesn't quite sink down to a place where we change the way we, we enter into a relationship with the earth, where we enter the chrysalis and we come out with a different perspective. So this is what I'd like us to explore, and I'm gonna invite my co wonderful panelists onto the stage to share their insights and their little pearls of wisdom of their experience of harmony and how can we move from this state of disconnect to a state of harmony with nature. Sister Jayanti, um, who needs no introduction, you've heard yesterday Christiana Figueres refer to her as, as the angel that appeared in difficult moments to meditate. So thank you, Sister Jayanti. <laughs> Um, Thomas Bjorkman. Thomas is the founder of Oak Island 
Foundation in Sweden. He will tell us a bit more about that. Um, yes, Thomas Brun. Thomas Brun is coming from Potsdam. He's a researcher and physicist at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. Welcome, Thomas. <laughs> Helen Mugo. Helen is from Kenya. She works with youth. She's working with the Catholic Youth Network for Environmental Sustainability in Africa. <laughs> and Haldora Gerhard Stattir, uh, who is an Icelandic actress, author, director, and professor at the University of the Arts here in Reykjavik. So before we start, I would just like to invite us to take 30 seconds of silence and as you do to sink into connection and harmony with nature, whatever that elicits for you. Thank you. So, I'd like to start with you, Thomas. Uh, you, you come from a country that has a tradition of um, connecting with nature, which you will tell us more about. But perhaps, um, if you could start by sharing a little bit of your own story and how you have come to thinking and feeling and embodying and living harmony with nature and what that means for you. Yes. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'm Swedish. I grew up in the 60s uh, to a large extent on a small fa family farm uh, on the west coast of Sweden, outside Gothenburg. Uh, and I don't think I've realized the importance of growing up on such a small family farm until very recently. And this was a very, very small farm. It was uh, 10 cows, three pigs, and uh, just enough field to support my grandparents. And being that close in nature and growing up in that safe environment, I think that gave me uh, an inner peace and a strength to do what I've been doing in life. And that has been a very hectic business life for me up until 10 years ago. So I started a number of companies and organizations. I built a banking business in Scandinavia. But when I sold that banking business 10 years ago, I really wanted to concentrate on trying to understand the relationship between inner personal growth and societal change. And that was the basis for the Oak Island Foundation. And uh, the Oak Island Foundation is called the Oak Island Foundation because it is centered around a beautiful space out in nature. And this was my way to try to offer the possibility for more people to get out of the city, get out of the normal business life, and really be able to try to get in deep contact with nature and to explore the effects that this contact with nature has on us as individuals and use nature as a catalyst both for inner personal transformational processes uh, but also to look upon the transformational process that we are going through right now as a society. 
three, four years ago, I started to realize that what we were doing at the Oak Island Foundation was really to reinvent the wheel. Together with my Danish co-author, Lena Andersen, we started to explore the roots in the Nordic countries when we as societies went through the crystallis the last time. And that was when we went from being very poor, non-democratic, agrarian countries just 150 years ago to just a few generations later being the happiest, richest, most stable industrial democracies in the world. And you might argue that uh, we are starting to lose this position a little bit. Not everything is, uh, is okay any longer if it's ever been in the Scandinavian countries. But I think that few could challenge the fact that we made this transition from pre-modernity into modernity in a way that uh, no other nations managed to do in such a short term and in such a peaceful manner. And we heard Bob mention here the first morning about this book, The Nordic Secret, that Lena and I came to, to write. And in that research, we found a newspaper article from the time when Sweden was, again, one of these very, very poor countries. And, and you might not even understand how poor we were, but people were starving, freezing to death. Ten, um, th up to 30% of the working population in, in Sweden alone emigrated to the US at the end of the 1800s just because the conditions were so bad. Uh, at this time, uh, a young man called Jalma Branting was in prison in Stockholm. And he was writing a newspaper article. And back then he was only 29 years old. Later he would be one of the most important person when it came to the building of the modern Swedish and Nordic societies. And he would become the Prime Minister of Sweden three times in the beginning of the 1900s, and he would eventually receive the Nobel Peace Prize as well. So, 29 years old, he's imprisoned, and he's imprisoned for blasphemy, because uh, he is an avid atheist, and he has been arguing for a secular society. And that was enough in Sweden back then, in this authoritarian society, to get you in prison. Still, he writes in this article, and uh, I'm quoting not verbatim now, but uh, he's writing something like, we social democrats have been too, too focused on the material aspects of our world. They are very important, but just as prerequisites. The real important thing is spiritual development. Yes, we need to take the whole of humanity to a new level. And that to Lena and myself was a complete surprise. We had never even in our own history books heard about that this building of modernity and the Volkshemmet and the struggle that the social democrats, but also liberals and the early feminists were, were doing in Scandinavia all over, that that was a journey of spiritual development. But it was, and that is the story that we are telling in the Nordic Secret. So where did they get these ideas of the importance of inner personal development from? They got it from the German idealist philosophers that were writing in the beginning of the 1800s. Philosophers like Schiller, Goethe, Herder, Hegel, von Humboldt. And these philosophers, they were all reacting against the Enlightenment philosopher's view of our mind, of our consciousness, of our mind as a rational machine, a rational decision-making machine. They said, no, 
Our minds are organic systems that are embedded and embodied in the totality of our bodies. They are connected with nature and they are embedded in our culture. And our minds and our consciousness are under a constant development throughout life. And in this lifelong development, the most important step that we can take as adults, not every adult <coughs> takes this step, but the most important step we can take is to go from being outer-directed, relying on an external authority, to becoming authors of our own lives, to find our inner compass and be grounded enough in ourselves not to have to rely on an external authorities. So these very visionary leaders, when they saw that the Scandinavian countries were going through this crystallis, this rapid transition from agrarian to industrial, from non-democratic to democratic countries, they wanted to create lots of imaginary cells, lots of conscious co-creators of this modernity. And they knew that the only way to build stable democracies is to build them from bottom up. So do you know what they did to be able to create all of these crystallized cells, all of these conscious co-creators of democracy and modernity? They opened retreat centers. And they opened many of them, and they opened out in nature. So by the turn of the last century, we had 100 retreat centers like this in Denmark, 75 in Norway, and 150 in Sweden, where young adults, after working perhaps five, five years or something like that, back then you were probably in your early 20s, could later with state subsidy spend up to six months in retreat with the explicit goal to become inner directed, to find your inner compass, to raise your consciousness to a level where you can become active co-creators of the new world, to be able to hold the complexity of the turbulent times. And I think that that is exactly what we need to do again. We need to find ways to reconnect to nature, reconnect to ourselves, and to bring about a critical mass of people that can act as conscious co-creators of the new world and do this from the bottom up. And when this was at its height, almost 100 years ago, then 10% of each young generation were actually participating in one of these retreats. We did it back then, and I think we can do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Jayanti. Thank you. And I'd like to begin with a greeting of peace, Om Shanti. And thank you for that story. I had no idea at all. So it's amazing how quickly you can learn things in a gathering such as this. And of course, it made me reflect on my own childhood, which was in what was at that time a small town in India, Pune. Now it's become a very huge IT city, big, big. But at an early age, I migrated with my parents to London. And the only contact with nature was a little patch of a garden that we had at the back of our semi-detached house. And it's a very different situation. But the awakening of the soul happened early on through my contact through my mother with the Brahma Kumaris. And that gave me an awareness of everything being sacred. And one of the things that had happened in India had been that I'd been made aware that life is sacred. You mustn't step on any little insect. If you saw it, it was alive, it was sacred. Um, and another very interesting connection that whatever is around us, the earth, the air, the fire, the water, the space, that's not just out there, but it's also actually what this body of mine 
is made up of. And so there isn't such a big difference between the outside and my own very precious physical body, this vehicle of mine. And so that connection had been made through the general awareness that people have in India, not even through any special ceremony or anything, but it was a very general awareness that they had. And so when I started to meditate at the age of eight, it gave me experience of transcendence, which then living in London and education and Carnaby Street and the Beatles and all of those things were in rage. And so I moved very far away from that spiritual awareness and still not any contact with nature except um, holiday time and yes, appreciating the beauty of nature but not really in any sense an involvement. But I very early, when I came back to spirituality, 19, then within a short space of time, the awareness that what was going on in the world was not right. Poverty, I don't know about the desecration of nature at that point, but Poverty was very blatant because I'd been traveling back and forth from India and the inequality and the injustice of the world. And that was partly my concern and motivation for moving to the path of spirituality because I felt that it would be spirituality that could actually make a difference and bring about equality. And within the community of the Brahma Kumari, it's a very small community only in India at that point. When I'd visit the headquarters, that was in a very sacred, beautiful, natural space in Mount Abu. And when I first went there, um, the road for 18 kilometers up the mountain was a dirt track. And there were only two taxis in the village. It was a little village. Um, there were no other cars at all. Even the doctor only had a bicycle. And we didn't have detergents. Um, at that time, they were still using wood. And the wood that was burned for fire for cooking, um, the ashes from that were used to clean the metal. It was a combination, maybe like pewter, something like that. You used the ashes to clean the vessels. So I didn't know what label to put on it, and I wasn't thinking of labels, but I look back and it was a very, very simple, basic lifestyle. And that connected to my heart. And in the mountains, the trees, very beautiful. Um, it gave me space to reflect, to be silent, and to experience things beyond the physical dimension. So that was, in a way, my first introduction to a very natural style of living. And later on, as the work of the Brahma Kumaris grew, I realized that the essential values, which are the values of the soul, are the things that everybody wants. And so there was really, at the core, at the essence, there were two things that linked the whole of humanity together. One was the mystical experiences that whether it's Sufis or Christians or Jews or Hindus, they all speak the same language when they're talking about the experiences of the mystical dimension. And secondly, all traditions, whatever they may be, or even no traditions of spirituality, humanistic thinking, but the same core values keep coming up, whether it's love and justice and truth and peace, happiness, and so it made me aware of the oneness of the big human family. And so when I first got involved with the United Nations, um, this was as an, as an NGO in the early 80s, again, it was this concept of peace being the most important thing. And then from there, the values that are being talked about today, but. Um, our introduction into the UN system within the NGO circles and then the connection with the organizations within the UN was very much based on values, so being part of the values caucus and so on. End of the 80s and there was a situation where in the UN we were talking about the Earth Charter 
and there was an invitation to participate from different perspectives and many of you here might recall the creation of the Earth Charter at that time. And that went on to Rio and later. Um, it was around that time of Rio that I became aware of climate change. And then in 2009, there was a very big, momentous change in which when we became connected as observers for the UNFCCC, um, we began to think, well, what is the stance of spirituality on all of this? And we understood that the most essential thing is the whole concept of consciousness. And yes, our organization must have planted millions of trees. And yes, we are very interested in renewable energies to the extent that um, we are now the single organization, the largest single organizational user of um, solar energy. We have a solar power plant that um, produces electricity 24 hours um, for a township where we have our big community uh, of about 20,000 people. So all of that's happening. But on the other side, we don't see that it's going to be possible just by planting a few trees. There'll always be the other side of the economy where trees aren't seen as the lungs of the earth or the sacred space that they hold within every single tradition and how through their beauty so many people are drawn into the sacred sense of a space which is beyond physical. The only way that, from my perception and my understanding, things can actually change is through a change of consciousness. Why? Because when our consciousness is spiritual, then we see the world as sacred and spiritual. And our heart is moved and touched and we reach out and want to save and protect. And when I forget my own spiritual identity and I'm connected just to matter, this matter, instead of the spiritual inner being. So this matter connected with this matter, and you have the materialistic society in which those sacred values have been forgotten and the economy takes over rather than concern for the sacred and the environment. Together with materialism, of course, then the example of the caterpillar, the consumer society where you're constantly consuming and taking rather than giving back and being part of the circle of life. And only when we change our consciousness back again to the awareness of spirit can the external situation change also. How many times are we consuming more than the resources this planet offers? You must have read those statistics. I'm not going to go into those details. So what do we do now? That for me is a very critical situation. I think it's not a difficult thing to change once I become aware of priorities and that spirit and that which is sacred is priority. Then I know that I have to simplify. I need perhaps to have a tiny bit of renunciation, but renunciation isn't difficult if you know what is more important. A mother sacrifices her sleep, and at that moment, sleep is not important, it's the child that's more important. Um, a father will sacrifice leaving his country to go away to earn something in another country to come back to feed his family. Things like that happen in a natural, organic way all the time. The question comes, what is more important, and what is it time to be doing. And at this moment, I really do feel that the crisis that is hitting us is not just the crisis of the developing world. It's not a separate boat with the developing world here and the developed world here. It's the same boat and we sail together or we sink together. And I'm putting it in strong language because I really do feel that it's the tipping point 
it's the moment of choice about which direction do we go in. Do we continue business as usual? And what lies ahead is collapse of civilization. These are not just my words. It's words I've been hearing from very eminent professors, whether it's Germany or Canada or various other places. Um, it's a reality of our times, and so it's time to wake up. And I think for me, the wake up call is, are we ready to lose our very home that has been a gift from the universe for us to live in and enjoy and appreciate and nurture and experience the preciousness of that? Or are we ready to throw it away? Thank you. Thank you very much. Haldor, you've um, recently been known for your role in Women at War, where you played two very different characters, uh, two different approaches, two different responses to what's happening. And I'd like to ask you, first of all, to tell us a little bit about your story and your journey, but also some learnings that you've had, or some insights from playing these two roles faced with the environmental crisis. Hi. <laughs> I'm so inspired that I, uh, I lose my track, you know. I really could like just reflect on what they are saying. Thank you for the gifts. Um, my approach will be, uh, I feel I've, I've been chosen to sit here because, uh, because not, not because of me, but because of a role I played. So it's kind of funny. But, I'm, uh, but then at the same time I say I'm here for a purpose, so I'm going to tell you my, uh, my path with taking on this role. I'm an uh, act actress, director. I work in the uni university teaching young children, no, not children, uh, adults, to become artists, to tell stories. So I'm a storyteller. And before religion, we had stories, because we are always trying to find a way how to, uh, how to um, have a conscious mind about how to approach each other and how to live together in the world, you know without stepping on each other's toes and, without, and living in harmony with the nature and with everything. So, the story, the film, Woman at War, then I play a part of a woman that is an activist. She has uh, lost belief in uh, her society to uh, stand with nature, so she forms a one-person army. And, uh, and I also play her twin sisters. And she is a yogi that is actually uh, having uh, for India to go to, a, uh, to go into the monastery for two years to really f find her inner path. Um, so I have to do the both parts. So, I, ha so in, I really felt easy to uh, connect with the activist, <laughs> being a single mother for seven years. You know, I really know how to do things. Uh, <laughs> and how to get my uh, acting career going on and how to really strive, have a car and take it to the da 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 da. You know, I really know I'm a survivor. Uh, but uh, so I could connect with the yogi. I, I went to meet a very dear friend of mine, a yoga, uh, yoga master. And, she, and uh, by meeting her, I realized uh, that <laughs> that uh, that she had such a great wisdom for me to, uh, preach, uh, to approach those two characters that she actually made the blueprint with me of the whole film. And uh, uh, in big colors, it was like this, that we talked mostly about the, uh, the Raja energy that is the activist, that the one that goes through life really with, uh, uh, with the rightful anchor. Uh, you just do it on your own and you, you conquer it, you know, you really struggle for it. And this was the main character of the film. But uh, what she taught me, uh, the yogi, about the energies, it is when you, do the, uh, when you fight with the rightful anger, the pendle goes back and it wakes up the ta tamas energy, the darkness. So in the film, it is like when she has uh, taken down the uh, electric lines over Iceland to make the aluminium factories uh, or make Iceland into an unstable country to invest in energy for big industries. This, is, this was her fight. Uh, 
Uh, then the Thomas, the darkness becomes much bigger. So the we have the prime minister on television. This is, you know, it's all in the film. It's not truth, you know. <laughs> so the prime minister wakes up. So the so the darkness becomes bigger. The Thomas energy, and they talk about her as brave uh, of uh, uh, fighting the brave of nature and blah blah blah. It really the darkness uh, takes over. And she's surprised because she had such a grateful anger inside her and she was really, uh, 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 the rightfulness was with her. She really thought she was doing the best for the future. In her storyline, uh, she, a uh, few years before, she wanted to have a adopt a child. She was refused to, to uh, be a single mother adopting a child. So she has, some, something has died inside of her the hope of being of use for humanity. So she is willing to do anything, uh, even uh, go into jail in, in the thought of children of the future. This is her inner model. But then in the middle of the film, she is told that she can actually have a child, adopt a child. So she has like, <laughs> so it's either the child or nature. That is the battle of the film. Um, of course, she chooses the child, but uh, uh, that, that, that I say, uh, being a mother. <laughs> uh, but uh, her sister, the yogi, she, she doesn't know that she's doing this battle. Uh, so the sister, she, has, she says, the one that used the swords will fall also from the sword. So she has the sattvic energy, that is the energy that is above the raja and the tamas, the pendulum that goes back and forth. And I, I go following the film through the world, meeting people, going through Q's and A's, I always become more and more the sattvic lady, you know. Uh, because what I realized is that the anger, it really gives you energy to do things, but you can't hold out with the anger. It is actually the sattvic energy, uh, it is the love that... Uh, uh, that keeps you stronger in the uh, in the battle in a long term uh, in a long term relationship, and this is what you were talking about. It, you really need to go somewhere and find the deep, deep, deep connection with with your battle and trust, trust that it will uh, go good, and you will not do it alone. We cannot do it alone. We cannot be a one woman army. It uh, you will you will. <laughs> you will lose it. <laughs> uh, it takes a village to raise a child, you know. Uh, now I feel I've lost the track, but I will, uh, the storyteller is failing me now. Uh, 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 how can I fall back onto track? Um, Will you help me, Nicole? Yes, I can help you. Well, yeah. Someone suggested 30 seconds of silence. Would you like to? Or I, yes. can, I can, otherwise I can ask you a question? Or yeah. silence? Thank you for the turkey. Okay, let, let's take a moment of silence. Yes. <laughs> At the same time as we were shooting the film and I was using this blueprint, the, the, uh, the blueprint in, under the whole script, the Raja energy, uh, waking the darkness and, uh, uh, and, uh, and trying to believe, would this, because this is a story, it's a film we are making, making uh, could this possibly, is it the truth? Is the world, is it really like this, like the yogi says? At the same time, we are having a big, big, uh, a dear friend of mine is taking on a big Raja fight, uh, officially in Iceland, because he is uh, protecting his daughter, and now I start to cry. Uh, it was a story here about Höfumhátt, speak up loud. And it's a dear friend of mine fighting because there's, uh, uh, with his daughter because the man that violated his daughter actually got, now I need the word, uh, 
Óttar. What would you say that is in English? Say, he redeemed his honors. And this was like, uh, it was for us, that mm. uh, uh, this was like really an incredible thing. But my, my friend, he was writing this post and he got the whole nation with him that we have to speak up loud because we were, uh, with, in, with parenthood, we really have a very focused mind, you know. But I realized he was doing it all in a Raja energy. So what happened with this power, this anger, this rightful anger, the Icelandic government fell apart, you know, and Otter, you were there. <laughs> and you were the ones that took these decisions, you know. So, and I thought doing, I was shooting the film at the same time, and I was like, if the yogis are right, the tamas will really rise now. The darkness will get bigger. And this is what happened. The government failed. That was actually not uh, facing with the, uh, the light of awareness, this matter of uh, the, uh, the, oh, yeah. Uh, so, and what happened was that the government that failed got more votes than before. So the Tamas really stride back. And this is, uh, at the same time as I was learning this, I said, how am I going to go through life in a satic energy, how can I take the strives that I need to take, but still not in a raja energy, that is the rightful anchor, but with a sattvic energy. So this is where I have been this whole, uh, after I shot the film and uh, traveling with the film around the world. I came to the conclusion, well, the earth doesn't need us. We need earth. So the earth doesn't really matter if we, dis if we destroy ourselves, because this is what we are doing. With, uh, we are de uh, we, with how we behave and how we consume, we are destroying ourselves. Earth will just like get, get us off, and th then she will repair itself. I mean, she will come up with new spices, and Earth thinks since mil millions of years. We are just thinking in 40 years, you know. Earth is in a bigger, much bigger scale, and a very sattvic scale, you know. But then it's like, I can just not sit back and, uh, <laughs> and be in the million scale, million year scale with Earth. I have, to, I have to find a way to bring the sattvic energy somehow into our battle, and then it's a contradiction, you know, battle and the satric energy. But, um, but still, um, then I came up with another, another uh, uh, connection. That is like, because I've worked a lot with UNICEF, I've been to places with UNICEF, and, I, and it's really like every adult in the world is responsible for every child in the world. So it's this, uh, and why? Because a child can't offend itself. It is the same with Earth. Earth cannot uh, protect itself. We really have to step in as adults. And still it takes a village to raise a child. So it is really about connecting and awareness. And how are we going to do this? How are we going to teach it and get it deeper? So this is where I'm at and I don't have the answers. I'm really like thinking how do we bring the sattvic energy uh, so the tamas doesn't all the time get bigger and, and push us back. We need to hold out and we cannot hold out with anger. We only can hold out with love. And this is where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Helen, you're working with youth in Kenya. Tell us a little bit more about your story and your work and your, how you feel about this topic, harmony with nature. Thank you, Nicole. So as she said, I am from Kenya, which is a country in East Africa. And to many of you, you may know it because of wildlife and um, it's supposed to be where nature is thriving as is the rest of Africa. And like Thomas, I grew up on a small farm um, in the Rift Valley part of Kenya, 
we grew crops and we had three cows for milk and some chicken. And at the time I did not um, enjoy living on a farm because um, I had to help with chores. Um, and they always coincided with the holiday season. So in, we'd go to school from January to April and then in April would be the rainy season so we would be planting. So there was no escape because you would be home on the holidays and you would help in the farm. And then we would go to school again from May to end of July. And then in August would be another holiday. And again, it coincided with a bit of farm work, uh, harvesting and planting again. And then December would be the long holiday and it would be um, harvesting season for most crops. And at that time, climate was consistent. You knew when the rains would come, you knew when it would be dry, you knew you could plan farming appropriately. And I loved animals. Um, I always played with them. I didn't know what I could do with animals. And I think my parents only knew about the veterinary officers. So they told me, if you want to work with animals, maybe you can become a veterinary doctor. But uh, when I saw the veterinary officers come home, it would be when the animals were sick. And it didn't look like something very nice to do, you know. Um, take care of the animals and watch them dying sometimes, it, it wasn't very nice. So I aspired to grow up and move to the big city and get a nice job and make money and I live a different lifestyle. And when I, I finished high school, I went to the university in Nairobi, which is our biggest city, the capital, and I studied business, I graduated and I got my first job as I had hoped. Um, but I remember that it didn't feel, it's not what I thought it would be. I thought it would be very exciting, you know. I have my own home, I am now independent. And so I worked for a few years um, for a big um, corporate organization. And then I moved to a few others. I, I still was looking for something, I wasn't very happy. and. I decided to move to what I would call development work. So I went back to school and studied um, gender and development because I wanted to empower and support the girls. Um, we have um, vast um, differences in gender and the women and girls are quite disadvantaged. So I wanted to work with little girls. Then um, a few years ago, I met with some colleagues who started my current organization, which is the Catholic Youth Network for Environmental Sustainability in Africa. And when I joined them, I, I didn't really know what, where I would fit in because I did not study um, environment. And I felt maybe I would support with administrative tasks and so on, until I realized um, just what they do and how it fits to my status at the time. So I had now come to appreciate the little village I grew up in and the lifestyle there and how different it was from the city. You know, the city is very loud, very crowded, um, very hectic. But when I would go home to visit my parents, it was all quiet. Suddenly I could notice, you know, that birds make some noise and it's really nice to listen to. You know, the things I used to take for granted were very valuable to me. I could look up and see the clear sky. I could um, look around and see all these green farms. Now, um, one of the, the biggest um, ecosystems in Kenya is called the Mao. It's um, a huge uh, range of forests. And from my parents' home, if you look um, up the hill, it's about two kilometers away you could see the start of the Mao, um, at least in our area. And back then it was all green and um, it was a huge, it's a huge, huge forest, which is um, the biggest um, source of rain and support for all the wildlife and the ecosystems. Um, but at the time, one of the biggest economic activities in my town was um, timber, you know, people would be um, milling timber and selling wood. It was employing a lot of people, but at the time people didn't know what impact we were you know, having and what damage we were doing. 
So right now, um, everything has changed. It's, um, the seasons as, as we used to know them have changed. Um, now you can wait for the rains to come between March and, and April, as uh, it used to be when we were growing up. But we have very long droughts, and the rains come when you don't expect them. So when you think it's going to be raining, it's very dry. When you think it's going to be dry, you have floods that come and sweep everything. So I think I found the organization at the time when I felt um, I need to understand what is going on and I would want to do something about it. And these were a group of young people who just felt we, need to, we have to do something. This is really bad. Um, People are dying, people don't have water, people don't have food. Um, the biodiversity is really being affected. And a lot of people don't even know what is going on. They can see the difference, but they are not aware of what is causing it or what they can do about it. And that is what um, we are trying to work on with the youth. Um, our biggest role, I believe, is just creating awareness on what is happening in the world and why things are as they are, you know. Why, um, why is it so dry suddenly? Why don't we have enough water? Um, why are there floods that come out of nowhere? And what can you do? And the beauty of working with young people is that they have so much energy and they want to do something. It's just that sometimes they are not sure what they can do, and they just need someone to nudge them, you know. Start from where you are, start in your school, start in your community, and then influence your, the, your whole school. You have seen what, uh, what is happening, for example, with, with Greta Thunberg. She started the strikes, and now it's a global, um, it's a, something every child is doing, every young person is doing. So, um, Having worked with the youth, I have had some interesting experiences uh, where, for example, you attend a conference and there is a workshop on youth, but you see that all the panelists are older men and women, and there's maybe two or three young people in the audience, assuming this was uh, the hall. So um, there is still a lot, of, a lot to do to you know, fully engage. And I love that the children and youth are now taking their space. They're challenging um, the grown-ups, you know. Growing up, we used to be told um, the parents are wiser, the grown-ups know better. And now it's as though that narrative is changing and people are, are now realizing that if we wait for the grown-ups to do it, then it'll be too late and we will not have a future. Um, I, I want to show something here. Um, I, I wanted to show this just as an example to show the reality um, where I come from. Um, this is a young boy, and this was from earlier this year. Um, so it is so dry, people don't have water. In many parts of, of Africa, um, having tap water in your house is a luxury, but at least people have a, a spring or a river close by or a well where they can go and get water. But now, because it is so dry, um, this, people have to walk really far to access such water. So in, it's not even about having you know, clean water anymore or purified water, it's, it's any water. So you will see someone drink this water and then the cow will come and drink water right there. So this, uh, to me, is not um, harmony with nature. This is disharmony. And um, this shows just how extreme the situation is. You know, sometimes we, we talk and yes, um, we need to do something, yes, um, climate change, yes, we are destroying the environment, but this is what happens to, to human beings. This is the impact that we're having. This, um, and this is just one example. Um, this is, so the rivers have dried, so people have to go really deep into the old riverbeds to access water. To, and this is probably after walking for many, many hours. And what it also means is that 
children miss school because their community has to move to, to try and get water. Um, so I just wanted to use those images to create, um, to show you just how bad it is so that when we're talking about human beings and what we have done to the environment, this, um, this is what people are living through. I know it may be, we have different contexts and different circumstances in our countries, but this is what is happening in my backyard. Now, um, on the positive side now, let me, <laughs> yes. It's not all doom. Um, what can we do about it? What are we doing about it? Um, if, you, if you listen to, I've, I've had uh, the opportunity to participate in some meetings like the, the, the Climate Corp and a few UN environmental assemblies. And sometimes if you listen even to governments, the member states um, debating about it, you, you get the, the, the impression that we don't really understand how grave the situation is and sometimes people will be arguing about texts or, you know, but you didn't do this, we are doing this, we can't do this unless you, you commit to this. So we, we sort of forget that in the reality of people and animals at that time when we are arguing over semantics and so on, is very different. So we have an, the urgent call to do something in our small capacities, in our different contexts. Um, yesterday somebody said that our differences um, are complementary. And what you do here affects me all the way in my corner of the world. What I do there um, affects you. Because um, we are, as human beings, we are just one small aspect of all of creation. And you cannot separate and say, you know, these are the animals, these are the people, these are the Africans or the Americans and the Europeans. We all have to work together because we share the earth and we are interconnected. Now, what um, can you do as an individual? That would be my challenge to you. It doesn't have to be, you don't need to have so much capital. Um, if I use the example of young people again in my organization. Um, it was just a few young people who said, we, we can't look back and watch, we can do something. And without um, money or vast resources, they just started gathering uh, young groups of people in schools, in, in churches, in registered youth organizations. And you sit together and think, um, in our immediate context, it could be in your neighborhood, in your school, what can we do in, within our capacity, within our ability? And it could be planting trees. It's not very hard to source for seedlings and identify a place, plant trees and tell people why you're doing that. It could be waste management, you know. Um, we are told that the rate at which we are, we are um, producing and using plastic um, by 2050, we will have more plastic than fish in the oceans. Can you imagine that, you know? We, we are using so much plastic. So you can decide to start an initiative to recycle or in your own house decide, I will not buy things with plastic, I will use um, recyclable shopping bags, I will recycle, I will avoid using plastic where I can. So that would be my challenge to each one of us. Um, Think about um, what you can do in your context. Now, um, here's the other thing that I wanted uh, to challenge us about, the motivation of what we do. Um, so this is um, the Maasai Mara. It's, um, it was declared one of the wonders of the world. Uh, this is the famous wildebeest migration. Um, and this is what is happening to that river now. So if people don't do anything about it, then um, trying to go back. Yes, so we will not have this. But my challenge is, um, should we conserve because we want to be able to see the wildebeest or because it's not our right to inter interfere with that ecosystem? So we also need a change of mindset that it's not our place to use nature as we wish. We are just um, lucky to be, as humanity, part of creation. And 
Um, sorry. So we, we have to play our role and recognize ourselves as just one part of a whole system. Um, this is a story I wanted to share of this man. Um, in all the droughts that we have been having, he realized that wildlife was dying. Um, biodiversity, as, as Nicole mentioned, is, is a big challenge. Species are, are really dying. You know, you hear many years from now, we may not have lions or elephants or rhinos and so on. So he realized that um, this, this is a park called the Tsavo in Kenya. It's, um, if you want to see elephants, it's one of the places you want to go. So it was so dry and the animals were dying. So he decided to be taking water. So he would hire um, this truck and just drive into the park to the watering hole that had dried up and just pour out the water and the animals would come and drink. And it's something that he would do. He got sickly. He didn't even have money for this, but he just trusted that he couldn't sit back and watch. And so he would do this and the animals with time knew. So they would see his truck and run and know that <laughs> there was going to be water. So when he did that, he challenged people and suddenly everybody became aware and they asked, what can I do? How can I build this? So what, um, it, we are challenged to take an initiative, do something um, where we are, start something small. It could be in your house, it could be in your neighborhood, and create a change. Um, Every spirituality, every religion in the world talks something about care for creation. If you look at the, tradition, the traditional ones, you know, Christianity, Islam, um, Hindu, and so on, and all other spiritualities talk about um, coexistence, care for creation, but we seem to have become very materialistic and consumerist, and we have destroyed harmony with nature. Um, this is one of my my icons, um, Wangari Mathai, she's, um, she was a Nobel laureate. She worked a lot for environment. And I want to read this as I finish up. In the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground, a time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. That time is now. And I feel that this is a very timely time to share that quote for this forum. And that is what I would like to leave you with. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas. <laughs> After all, I mean, it's been very, very rich. Maybe we take a, maybe we take a few seconds of mm -hmm. silence yeah. just before you. You're a physicist, you're also an artist at heart. Um, tell us a little bit about your story and how you relate to nature and harmony. Thank you, Nicole. Welcome, everybody. Indeed, this has been such a rich panel already. <laughs> I feel eager to engage in much more conversation than what we can facilitate in this next 25 minutes. <laughs> I enjoyed your story and I look forward to watching the film, honestly. <laughs> Harmony with nature, it's uh, such a deep topic and in a way, while sitting here, I realize once again, I'm definitely not an expert in that topic. Um, I grew up in Western Germany, uh, born in 1980, in a middle-sized town. And I think I grew up in a society that I still experience as quite traumatized and disharmonic in many ways. So my own sense for harmony was very much hurt all through my 
upbringing, I would say. And when I experience harmony with nature, in our conversation earlier, you asked me, when did I experience harmony with nature? I did have these moments, and they shaped me very much. I could resonate very much with how Sonia framed her experience with nature. And at the same time, I don't know whether you know this feeling of uneasiness, whether this harmony I experience in nature is just something that pacifies my own disharmony that I experience in the society in which I grew up. Um, and that continues to stay a question in my mind. Like I, I enjoy to go hiking and just start walking and walk through Germany without a plan, with a little bag, and just see what wants to happen. And I experience deep moments of harmony. And at the same time, I wonder, is that just a compensation for all the disharmony that I'm experiencing in everyday life and in human relations and in structural context that I'm working in otherwise? So, um, yeah, there is much to be said. How much can I really say about harmony? But at the same time, when we talk about harmony with nature, I mean, we are nature. I am nature. I am a human being, just like every one of us here. And I have a deep sense of trust in whatever, whatever evolution may have intended or thought in bringing about humanity. It's certainly not a mistake as much as I feel humanity is doing so many things to itself, to each other, and to the, uh, the non-human life, I have a hard time believing that this can be a mistake. I somehow trust, uh, trust evolution, you could say, and something I cannot understand as, maybe it is something spiritual, it is, it is a, an unreasonable sense of trust that I have, and I am part of this weird phenomenon, um, <laughs> So I have that sense of harmony somehow in my own nature. I am not against nature. I am nature. So the question often for me is, how can I cultivate my sensitivity for what that inner essence may be and how it manifests in all relationships that I practice every moment? Having said that, <laughs> you asked me for my journey. You introduced me as a physicist and artist by heart. Yes. Um, I sort of chose to be a physicist because I didn't want to make a decision what I want to do in life. <laughs> when, I, when I finished school, I was basically interested in everything, <laughs> but I was not courageous enough to become a pianist. I loved the piano, um, but I felt maybe turning my passion into a profession could also violate that essence that I feel when playing the piano. And I didn't want to be forced to play 10 hours of Beethoven every day and then tour around and play the same Beethoven sonata 30 days in a row. Um, with physics, I thought, I just learn analytic thinking um, and we'll see what I apply it for. Um, but there was, um, I started with astrophysics originally and there was a professor who shaped my own thinking and my whole further story very much. He, he was a Bavarian, and for those of you who may know Bavaria, he, those are very authentic, very passionate uh, people. <laughs> and he started his lecture about astrophysics with a series of three lectures about the development of the cosmological worldview over the last 10,000 years. Basically, what has looking at the stars meant for human beings? And how has it shaped the way how we construct the world? And uh, he emphasized the, the beauty of coherence that has been there for humans for a long time, that observation of the stars and of nature needed to resonate with the interpretation of meaning in the world that was experienced. And he very clearly expressed also his own suffering that this coherence was lost in the development of scientific history in the last couple of hundred years. And the other thing he emphasized was, he said, I'm offering you a very specific way to look at the stars or the sun. It is useful to answer a very specific set of questions for a very limited set of purposes. But of course, each of you will go out at night and look at the stars and still look at the same stars from different angles for a different purpose. You will look up and see beauty. You will see home. You will see comfort. And this is something I cannot tell you how to approach that. My methodology is very limited for the set of purpose, set of questions. Please never lose the ability to change your window of perception. 
And this is, I, th I ended up doing my PhD in nanophysics, which has nothing to do with uh, cosmology. But in parallel, I started writing fiction novels, only for myself, as my own process of maturing, you could say. And that brought me to the issue of sustainability, actually. I, in the process of writing these novels, I wondered what could be a, a concept of a civilization where humans and human life is really embodying and living a harmonic relationship with everything around it. So I had no idea about that, so I got interested in the topic of sustainability. And there, my observation was that so many people, and that connects to your story about the, about the film and the activist, I realized that there are so many people in this field of sustainability who have very strong convictions what needs to be done. And in the way how they fight for these ideas, I felt many people are actually perpetuating the patterns that I perceive as disharmonic in the first place. Like you say, how can you be active from a Sutwick energy, but not from a Tamas energy? And, and my, my need, and that connects back to this astrophysics professor, <laughs> my need was to support people in listening to each other instead of talking at each other and trying to convince each other that they have found the best solution, what now needs to be done to save the world. Yeah? <laughs> Which is another term we could reflect upon. Is it possible to save the world? There was a wonderful woman I once met. She reported from Detroit, where a woman from the transition town movement said, you cannot save Detroit. You can only be Detroit. This sentence still resonates with me, and I keep contemplating on it. This notion of saving the world is, to me, is so much an expression of dichotomizing between us and the world, and believing that there is something out there that needs to be saved. Um, and that is, to me, in profound con conflict with the idea of harmony. Because harmony, for me, is the experience of a quality of relationship. And um, relationship you know, I can't dichotomize, I can't say there is something else if I focus on the experience of the relationship. So, to kind of bring these threads together, um, in my work I realized um, phys studying physics has been helpful as a way to identify structures in chaos, <laughs> not for the knowledge that I've gained, but more as a way to stay humble and see in the very different ways how we can look at, at the phenomenon of the world that we experience, there are structures that we can identify. And these trying to, it was touched in the, in the morning in the meditation, identifying these common denominators and keeping exploring what, what is the commonalities behind our positions instead of trying to convince each other we, I know how to create harmony, yeah? <laughs> and I have the best way how to create harmony in this context. Um, staying in a questioning mode and seeing what, what is the underlying perception, what is actually the purpose, why I am interested in this whole aspect of nature. And because my observation is that many stakeholders that we are working with who are so passionate about trying to improve the state of the world, to me it feels like we are trying to save the conditions so that we feel more safe um, instead of trying to embody our own safety. I, I make a little jump and maybe then the rest gets solved in our conversation, but I was very much reminded while I was listening to you to a book that I once read by Daniel Quinn. The book is called Ishmael. And yeah, I hear several people know it. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious. I don't want to repeat something everybody knows. Who has read the book? Okay, it's not a majority, so I'm not boring most of you. <laughs> it's such a powerful book. It's a Socratic dialogue between a gorilla and a human. And the, um, the human response to, um, to an advertisement, um, a pupil is sought with an honest desire to save the world. And he says, okay, this must be a hoax. Whoever can offer this, I don't know. And he finds that gorilla in an apartment. And the gorilla guides this pupil through a process of reflecting 
what is your understanding of being human? How did you come to this understanding? And he goes back to the Neolithic Revolution 10,000 years ago, when humans became settlers, and they left the, the state of being nomads, but they cultivated land. And the, the clue is, the cult, they cultivated land as a response to their existential fear. The idea was, we are using nature to create conditions in which we feel safe. Because we are afraid of tomorrow. What could be tomorrow? As a nomad, you don't know what tomorrow is, but you live in abundance of what is being given to you. But identifying this transition in time, 10,000 years ago, as the root for cultivating a civilization of fear, that has influenced me very much. And I must say, I, I don't know whether in my life I will ever come to a point where I feel I have let go of that fear because all the structures I'm working with are so much an embodiment and a manifestation of that fear, trying to create safety, although all of us know there is no real existential safety. And that brings me back to my hiking and my experience of harmony with nature. One of the questions you asked is like, how can we shift from this mode of exploiting nature? To me, it is, and I'm shaped by Erich Fromm in that respect. I feel a lot of that using of nature is really a way to reconnect and pacify our own fear. And when I'm hiking and I'm just walking, not knowing where I sleep the next day, um, I am surprised and encouraged how little I need. Over the course of the weeks, more and more needs just dissolve. And that is a... Yeah, that is something that encourages me to continue that journey also in my professional and personal life. How, how much do I really need? And how much can I relax into that unknown and yeah, being grateful for not needing very much, but just experiencing the rela relationality that I'm part of in every moment. Thank you. So there's so many beautiful threads that have been woven and I feel like, <clears throat> I mean, this whole resonance between the inner, how we, how we cultivate our inner sense of consciousness and connection with nature and then the outer, how do we channel this energy? I mean, you're talking about the youth, how do we channel now also an, an, the rightful anger that comes up when people see what's happening? how do we balance this work on our inner, these inner conditions and the outer action, right? And you were mentioning some examples of what some of these actions could be, but in what state of mind um, do we do these actions? And for me, what's always a, a really a question which I haven't solved yet, and maybe I'd, I'd love to open up a brief second round of any, any comments you want to make also on what you've heard. On, and for me, it's really this tension between um, really being willing to see and acknowledge the magnitude of the problem along with the emotions that this may elicit and then how do I, and the urgency and then how to engage in action at the, at the same time cultivate those qualities that are maybe more you know, require retreat and, and contemplation and, and I'd love to explore maybe a little bit in the second round, more how do we cultivate this within us in the face of such urgency and in the face of potential um, tremendous emotion and, and grief. And so, I don't know if, it, if I, I mean, you talked about fear, there were a number of things. I don't know if any of you would like to say something about that, yes. Sister Jayanti. Thank you. I'd just like to say that um, I've taken a lot of inspiration and hope from the plan that you suggested, that we give young people six months off to be able to go on a retreat and be in touch with themselves and nature. And I was amazed to hear you talk about the Sato Rajo Tamo, because it's not a Western concept. <laughs> and maybe some people, does everybody understand Sato Rajo Tamo? Yeah. Yes, fantastic, <laughs> we've come a long way. <laughs> because just a couple of years ago I was with a pretty enlightened group in Belgium. Well, the organizer was from Belgium, but we were in Switzerland. 
And there were many people who had never heard of these terms. It was very foreign. They are foreign language. But um, what you shared, you know, how do we move to the sato, the sattvic, um, it's a shift. It's just a shift. You press a button here, and consciousness changes. You see something of beauty. It touches you, and you realize you can't kill, you can't destroy. You move to the sato of pure love. And so to find that this very, very ancient concept has come to Iceland and the world, the world is represented here, it's a wonderful feeling to know that these ideas are spreading everywhere and everybody's aware of these things. But one, one thing I'd like to add to that, um, not only is it a very natural and easy transition from tamo to sato, but it's actually something that has to happen. It's like with the cycles of nature. From darkness, darkness doesn't carry on forever, even though in Iceland you might think that the winter is lasting forever. But there's light. And when the light comes, it lasts for nearly 24 hours. So amazing. There's a natural progression, a natural shift. And so I think where the world is headed is in a very natural way towards that pure sattu. And you're offering the vision of hope of one man, but also young people. And Thomas linking the artist and the scientist together. Beautiful. Um, one last thing from me. I think that when there's a spiritual consciousness, it offers hope. You know that things are not just as they seem to be, but there's something not just even beyond up there, but beyond here. Whatever I'm seeing is not forever. It's transient. And there's something beyond that has to happen. And there'll be a natural evolution to a world in which there is love and justice. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like on the panel like to say something? Yeah, and then we'll take a couple of questions, but yes, please. Just briefly, directly to connect it to what you said, Shanti. Um, I didn't touch on the aspect of dying. Um, I wanted to originally. <laughs> to me, that is such an important aspect that we are mortal beings. And a lot of where I identify fears in myself that push me towards certain reactions, um, I realize how they are influenced by the feeling that I have to defend something or I have to protect my whatever I think is meaningful. But I was lucky enough to spend one year after my school in a home for elderly people with, with people in the last months of their lives. And that has affected me very much. And it's weird to say that, but I, I feel a growing comfort with just the, the clearness that I will die. And I don't know when and I don't know how and whatever way, but it's clear that I will die. And all of us here will die. And it's okay, I find, that we will die. So I, I keep asking, in, in that clearness, what am I really afraid of? And as you say, it's on the one hand, it's the hope for we are returning to where we are coming from, a place that reaches beyond the division that we experience in this material world. And on the other hand, it helps me not take things too seriously and not feel I have to push for this or that. It can happen as it wants to happen and relax into that, uh, into that emergence, you could say. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to add that forums like this one we're having here is also for me a very big step in moving forward and th talking about living in harmony with nature and learning from each other, sharing, that energy also goes a long way. So mm -hmm. I think keep having such forums and encouraging each other, we are also moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you like to say something else or, or we open up? I would, I would like to say that the button, uh, I've started to learn it also because I'm a grandmother and it happens naturally when you become a grandmother. 
Uh, when you have children, you try to avoid them from uh, making mistakes, but when you're a grandmother, you love seeing them making mistakes. <laughs> it's really like you have humor for it and you actually, you love it. You just, just uh, you, you have a different scale, you know, that they will not uh, have to go to hospital, you know. Uh, you're, uh, because then you have to put them in the car and drive and all this, you know. But you really love seeing your grandchildren making mistakes. Because you know there is the le learning. The, the big lessons are in the mistakes. I just wanted to share this. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you because when we spoke you, earlier, Haldara, you, you mentioned how this grandmother energy was also more of what we need in relationship to, to each other, but also to how we take care of the earth. So thank you. Thomas. Yes, uh, I just have a brief comment on this uh, tension we have between the urgency we f feel with all our social problems and with the deterioration of an environment and everything. We, we feel an urgency to, to act and we are told all the time that we are, have to act quick. We thought we had 20 years, now we have seven years, so we need to act quick. Um, I have an African friend, his name is Bayo Akomolafe. He's uh, an African philosopher. He, you know, do you know Bayo? Yeah, he, he's a wonderful person. He's, he's not very, very old, but he's very wise. He's in the, his mid-30s. And uh, he said something uh, to me once that really uh, made me think. Uh, he said, and I'm quoting him now, my ancestors tells me that we are in an emergency, so we have to slow down. <laughs> and that was really sort of, yeah, that is so true. So how can we do that? At the same time, as we know that the time is running out, how can we slow down? Thank you. Thank you. For Thomas, uh, the audience, uh, I, I had had a pre-death experience. And the good news is we don't die. What <laughs> dies is the body. <laughs> Thank you. So I was a little shocked by the information about the plastic in the sea. Um, I tell you, for example, in uh, Spain, uh, the coast, we have oranges, yeah? And we have many of our oranges on the floor because it's cheaper to bring them from South Africa. If you imagine just the oranges being taken, palletiered on the ship, traveling, reaching Spain, and palletiered on the market, how many people are there involved? And moreover, we are tolerating that the oranges are traveling while the South Africans are not allowed to do it. So I think if we, we need to slow down, yes, but to think how to stop this. Because we can meditate, we can come into higher consciousness, but unless we stop 
the system we are creating, uh, it is going to be very difficult, whatever we do. I, I don't think we need to survive. I don't believe in death. I think it's going to be a very big relief for the rest of the planet if we disappear. But I also feel a responsibility for, for example, my niece or my nephews or the next generations. And if we think about evolution, we really maybe need to take responsibility on our options. But really, each time I remember about the oranges, I have a problem. And today, when you were telling about the plastic, it's the same. It, it brings me to, to a build, to an image in my brain that is difficult to delete. And I only want to point on this. The necessary, the, we have to change the economical system itself, complete. That is, I don't know how, but Maybe that's the best way is just to slow down, I don't know. Thank you. Is there any other question? Or any question brief? Yeah. Yes, sure. I was wondering whether we wanted to give a response to everything, but please, no, please go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Um, when you were speaking, Thomas, I began to reflect on it and You've just expressed the tension between these two ideas. But for me, this concept is about slowing down my thinking. Because when my mind is racing, I'm not thinking very clearly. And I don't find answers. But when I learn to slow down my mind, then my inner intuition works, but also the right thinking happens. And it's possible to have a very natural lifestyle in which you're working for 18 hours a day. Very natural. Not forced or anything, but 18 hours a day, you can keep going and do a lot. But you need to learn to slow down the mind. Then you can do what you need to do instead of scattering energy and wasting energy. But you'll be focused and you'll achieve what you want to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take one last comment question. Thank you. I would just uh, like to share an experience I had uh, 10 years ago that I went quite close to death and I had a flashback experience. I saw my life in uh, 10 seconds. Since then, I reevaluate my life and I really started to slow down, meditate and come closer to, let's say, a spiritual path. And with this uh, slow down, I really go fast. So I guarantee from my personal experience that if you really slow down, you will make it happen really fast. And uh, thank you for it. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I think we're coming to the end, I'm sorry. So I guess we can continue the conversations at the break. Um, I'd like to ask if anyone on the panel wants to share a final reflection, and, and otherwise the Sister Jayanti will afterwards lead us to a closing meditation, but first Thomas, please. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, I would indeed like to share a final reflection. Um, Thomas, you spoke about the maturing, basically, and to me that has a lot to do with taking one's own, uh, one's own responsibility, as it was discussed yesterday, seriously. That has so much to do with letting go of the notion to talk about the big problems out there, but to see what is my relatedness in this moment. Um, otherwise, I feel we are giving away the responsibility and blame somebody else, and we always ask somebody, please, somebody needs to do something about X and Y. And this keeps moving around. I've experienced this for so long and it's so frustrating. People in very influential positions still keep pushing around responsibility. So for me, it, it is, and it is also what my understanding from complex system science is, when we are concerned about the system as a whole, 
this is the macroscopic state is just the manifestation, the energetic optimum for a dominant relationship pattern. But changing that relationship pattern is within every agent that each of us is and are. So in those relationships is where the change happens. You can use very different languages for describing this phenomenon, but taking our own responsibility seriously, that's to me the key essence. And feeling what is the quality that I bring into those relationships, rather than talking about the abstract issues out there that I may not be able to do anything about. And that may trigger my own fears. I can be so caught up thinking about Donald Trump yeah, and allowing it to fear, cause fear in me, but I cannot do anything about this guy out there. You know, it's a, it's a tension that we are living in. I care about the big picture and I, I love the world as a whole. My own efficacy is very specific and understanding this and understanding my purpose and my contribution is so challenging in itself. Those are the qualities I care about and I still probably will learn for my whole life how to do that. Thank Hopefully. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, asking Sister Jayanti to lead us into a closing meditation, I would like to thank Sonia for the second chrysalis, which you have seen appear as we were talking. So, thank you. So, please. Sitting comfortably, I reflect on the things I've been hearing about and I go on an inner journey. And in the awareness of the inner being, I'm aware that this is the being that creates, nurtures, and sustains, and allows things to move on and return to a new creation. I am this being of light. And in this awareness, there is peace, there is truth, there is love and joy and purity. My thoughts slow down and each thought leads to an experience of the treasures that I hold within. Aware of these treasures I know that these treasures are not only for me, but they are to be shared. And in fact, each human being carries the same treasures of beauty, goodness, generosity, and truth. coming to the awareness of who I am, connecting with the divine, the supreme, the being of light, connects me with the whole of humanity in the bond of truth and love. And not only are we connected? But we are also connected with all forms of life. We share the same home, the same planet, and we are connected to the elements of nature. Nature itself And in this awareness, 
love flows, the heart opens, and we share the abundance of the goodness within with everyone and everything all around. The vision of the future is of a world of truth, love and beauty. And we move towards making that vision a reality. Om Shanti. Thank you. Thank you.